Hi, this is David Desert of Panconology. In this video, we'll look at whether changes in CA199 levels during treatment can be used to track treatment effectiveness. It's a topic that has been studied and underused by oncologists. We'll look at how good it works and the ways it might be improved. Pancreatic cancer is an aggressive disease and many of us would like to know as soon as possible whether a treatment is working or not. Oncologists have suspected that a patient's CA199 levels give hints into treatment effectiveness. There's a lot of published research looking at CA199 levels and overall survival, which is a great thing to know. But when estimating a particular treatment's effectiveness, I prefer to know the time to progression or progression-free survival numbers. Each patient's overall survival, or OS, is the time a patient is on this treatment, plus the next treatment, plus any subsequent treatments, and the non-treatment period until their death. A lot of things unrelated to this treatment may be included in this time. Progression-free survival, or PFS, is only the time on the current treatment. When the treatment stops working, the patient moves on. Overall survival is really the ultimate goal, so for oncologists it's the measure of choice in research. But for measuring the effectiveness of a single treatment, I like PFS. Another measure of treatment effectiveness is the overall response rate, or ORR. It's the percentage of patients that had tumor shrinkage of at least 20%. However, it doesn't tell us how long a response was, just how many there were. I find that researchers set up experiments to learn what they want to know, which is not necessarily what we want to know. It's frustrating because the data to answer our questions was usually gathered, but it wasn't published. It can take looking between the lines to get the answers relevant to us, and that's what we'll do here. I want to explore whether monitoring a patient's CA199 levels can predict treatment effectiveness. The Phase 3 impact trial of Gemzar Abraxane versus Gemzar alone is a pretty well published trial. Besides the main results paper, it spawned several other papers looking at specific aspects of the trial. We're going to look more at this one. The recorded patient CA199 levels 8 weeks into the trial. As the title says, this paper found that patients with CA199 decreases at week 8 also tended to have better overall survival. This was true regardless of which treatment they received. We're going to dig into how well the 8-week changes in CA199 predicted patient overall responses to treatment. We're going to graph the overall response rate to treatment versus the percentage change in CA199 in the first 8 weeks. You won't find a graph like this in the paper. I had to generate it from the reported results. The paper divided patients into groups based on ranges of CA199 drops. At the far left, we have only the patients who saw at least a 90% reduction in their CA199 levels. That group would include anyone whose CA199 dropped all the way to zero. The next group includes patients with CA199 drops of between 60 and 90%. Then the group with CA199 drops of 20 to 60 percent, 0 to 20 percent, and finally the group of patients who saw their CA199 levels increase by any amount. Here I've plotted the median overall response rate and 95 percent confidence intervals of each of these groups, regardless of which treatment they received. You can see that as the CA199 drops get more pronounced, there are more and more responders to the treatment. When the CA199 drop is almost complete, the treatment response rate is about 53%. On the other end, the response rate for patients who saw their CA199 levels increase was only about 11%. In the supplementary table to the paper, there was some more data that let me estimate more patient treatment responses at more CA199 drop ranges. I've made these points a little less bright. The extra data they presented was not as explicit, and I made a few guesses to estimate these points. 
Again, it's another case of having to read between the lines to get the information you want. When I add in the line connecting the median values, it's pretty clear there is something to this. Larger drops in CA199 correspond to more treatment responses. But before we get too excited, let me show you what it would look like if changes to CA199 exactly predicted the treatment response. At small CA199 changes, we'd have no responses at all. Then, at some magical CA199 percentage drop, we'd have a 100% response rate. With a result like this, we could exactly predict who was going to have tumor shrinkage based on CA199 levels alone. It's pretty obvious we're far from that type of result. One more thing I'd like to show here. The overall response rate for patients included in this paper was about 25%. Patients with CA199 drops of 68% or larger had a better than average response rate. And patients with CA19 drops of less than 68% had a lower than average response rate. We might think of the CA19 drop of 68% as a threshold for this test. The question remains, how good were eight-week changes in CA19 in predicting the response to tumor shrinkage? One way to measure the effectiveness of a test is with a receiver operating characteristic curve, or ROC curve for short. On a graph like this, an ideal test would have a curve like this, starting at the bottom left, going straight up to the top left, and then going from there to the top right. The goodness of these tests is measured by the area under the curve. This ideal test has an area of 1 whereas a worthless test is represented by a diagonal line from the bottom left to the top right. It has an area under the curve of one-half. Most tests are somewhere in between. Using the data from the paper, I've plotted the ROC curve at each cutoff value of eight-week CA199 drops reported. This data point represents the goodness of this test at CA99 drop of 90%. The y-axis tells us that with a CA99 drop of 90% or more, 44% of patients who had tumor shrinkage were correctly predicted. The x-axis tells us that 13% of those not responding to the treatment were predicted to have responded. Again, with an ideal test, we'd see this data point all the way up here in the top left corner. Let's look at another one. This data point represents the goodness of this test at a CA199 drop of 60%. The y-axis tells us that with a CA199 drop of 60% or more, 77% of patients who had tumor shrinkage were correctly predicted. That's an improvement. The x-axis tells us that 45% of those not responding to the treatment were predicted to have responded. This 60% cutoff correctly identifies more treatment responders, but nearly triples the number of false positives. Now let's draw in the curve. The area under the curve is 0 0.724, which is not that great, but also not useless. We'll discuss some ways we might improve this test in a little bit. Another use of the ROC curve is to show us what threshold we might use for the test. In other words, what level of CA199 drop best separates patients responding to the treatment versus those that are not. We got an idea from the last chart where a 68% or larger drop in CA199 seemed to indicate more responses. On an RIC curve, we take this diagonal line and slide it up until it is just touching the edge of the curve. The place where it touches the curve last is where we'd like to set the threshold for this particular test. In this case, we find that a CA199 drop of around 75% is best. To summarize, this test as implemented in this paper is not that great of a test. If we wanted to turn this into a test for overall response, we'd look at a CA199 drop of 75% or more to indicate a better chance that the patient is responding to this treatment. How can we improve this test? 
Well, first of all, we could exclude patients that don't produce CA199. We've previously discussed that around 10% of the population does not make CA199. The authors don't state whether these patients were identified nor how they were handled. Their percentage changes in CA199 could land them into any of these groups, adding noise to the data. We should exclude these patients from the analysis. Second, each patient makes different amounts of CA199. For example, in three patients with identical 3 centimeter sized tumors, the readings may be wildly different. So perhaps a percentage change in CA199 is not the best indicator. Something else we could do is factor in the tumor location, such as in the head, the body, or the tail of the pancreas. CA199 can be produced in ways that are not directly related to tumor size. Tumors at the tail of the pancreas can reduce some of those other sources, such as from bile duct blockages. The authors didn't separate patients out by location of the primary tumor within the pancreas. They might have gotten better results with patients just with tail tumors. Something else to consider is the timing of the CA199 tests. It's well known that dying tumor cells also elevate CA199. An increase in CA199 can sometimes be a good sign. Sometimes CA199 levels can spike up after treatment as tumor cells die off and then go down below later. We need to make sure we take the next measurement after this spike has happened. CT scans can overestimate the tumor size. Right now, CT scans are considered the gold standard for measuring tumor size. However, these scans can overestimate it. As the tumor is killed off, it can leave behind dead scar tissue that still looks like a tumor in the scans. We're going to need a better way to measure the size of the living tumor cells in a patient. We've just reviewed a single paper on using CA199 measurements to monitor treatment effectiveness. There are many more, but none I've seen try to factor out the other causes of CA199. I feel that by monitoring our CA199 levels over time, as well as some related symptoms, we could remove some of the effects of these other causes and improve its predictive power. I think that each patient's CA199 responses will be unique, but will still follow a set of rules. If we understand what's happening to us, we can make better decisions.